director for the for the Injury and Violence Prevention Center here at the University of Colorado Anschutz campus, where I lead the Firearm Injury Prevention Initiative. Today's presentation is part of our regular webinar series where we present topics in injury and violence prevention with a particular focus on firearm injury prevention and novel collaborations or ways of thinking about the topic. Before I jump into today's session, I wanna point out a few logistics. So first we are recording this session and we will send out the video link to everyone who registered. Uh, we'll also put uh, in the chat box where you can find past webinars online. And we ask that you please put any questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we'll have uh, plenty of time for a, uh, a moderated discussion at the end. So please do put your questions in there. And now um, I wanna turn over uh, to today's session and uh, welcome our speakers. And let me just, um, Okay, I think we're good, a thumbs up. Uh, so today I'm really excited for this. This session has been uh, a while in the making um, and uh, I, th I think it's gonna be a really interesting discussion. Uh, we're gonna be talking about risk assessment and firearm access. Uh, and I'm really grateful to the uh, colleagues who have joined me, all of whom are here in, uh, in Colorado working on these, this topic in one way or another. Um, the Firearm Injury Prevention Initiative at our campus really is uh, aims to coordinate, synergize, stimulate really collaborative approaches to preventing firearm injuries. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that, that we're really focused on partnership and collaboration with all kinds of affected communities, um, certainly research, education, um, and understanding how policies are used. And, and so that's really a grounding for where we're coming at this from today is thinking about across disciplines, how do we do risk assessments? How do we think about whether someone appears safe or not to have access to a firearm? And what are the kinds of things that go into those decisions and what are perhaps the limitations? So the central questions for us today that we're gonna be talking about um, phrase two different ways. So is this individual, uh, and we're really gonna be talking about adults today, but is this individual safe to access firearms? Or put another way, does this individual pose a significant or imminent threat to themselves or others? So we're gonna be tag teaming here at the beginning. We'll each be presenting briefly on perspectives from our own fields, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards. Uh, Jacqueline Clark is a firearm retailer and co-owner of a large uh, firearm retail uh, outlet and range here in Colorado. And she's gonna be talking about at the point of sale, what are the kinds of things that firearm uh, outlet employees are looking for or thinking about what, when someone is uh, interested in purchasing a weapon. Uh, Michael Viktorov is a family physician and also firearms instructor. Uh, he wears many hats, but today is going to be really focused on the, uh, the, the issues that firearms instructors face, um, particularly in, in the context perhaps of someone wanting a concealed carry uh, sort of approval from a course and, and how do you make those decisions. Um, I also wear many hats, but today I'm going to be thinking like an ER doctor and try to present briefly what it is that we do in the um, emergency department when someone comes to us with potential imminent risk for suicide or homicide uh, and what kind of engagement do we have or not uh, around questions of firearms. And then last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Rick Martinez is a forensic psychiatrist here at the University of Colorado and he's going to be taking a deeper dive into how forensic psychiatry thinks about these issues, um, including perhaps touching on questions about when is someone safe to get weapons back after an extreme risk protection order? So there are a couple big caveats to today's session. Um, the first is that laws vary widely across the country um, from state to state. All of us are in Colorado and that's the perspective we'll probably be relying on. Uh, so certainly uh, it's important to know the regulations in your own area and to think about how um, some of these processes might be different where you live. We are also not attorneys <laughs> and uh, uh, we will be touching on some sort of legal and policy questions, but at the end of the day, uh, please don't act on any specific things we say about laws. We also wanna recognize that there are a lot of other people who face these kinds of uh, decisions, teachers, law enforcement, uh, law enforcement officials, really uh, other kinds of physicians, anyone who's interfacing with individuals who might have access to firearms and they may have different processes or, or similar processes that they're working through. Uh, but we hope that today can start the conversation. 
Uh, and I think we may leave with more questions than we uh, provide uh, answers to. And I think that that's okay. But the, our intent is really to start this conversation, identify some of the gaps, but also perhaps some shared experiences. And so with that, I wanna present one brief case. We won't be talking about this in detail in each of our sessions, but just to really get us all on the same page and, and mindset. A sample case of a middle-aged man comes to a gun shop uh, to purchase a weapon or uh, for a training course. He comes in by himself, looks like he's maybe in his early 40s. You know, he's, he's neatly dressed in casual but inexpensive clothing. He's got a wedding ring on, you notice. And he looks tired, probably like most of us do, um, but he's not tearful or otherwise in, in any particular distress. In talking with staff, he makes a couple jokes about sort of being too busy and he's stressed out at work and wanting a vacation. You know, he mentions his wife also works and they've got three kids. They're busy with school and sports, which is why he's tired. Um, and he says he hasn't owned a gun before. He's heard on the news that crime rates are going up. And so he's interested in getting one for protection. And then I'll just take this off the table too. So he's a Colorado resident and he does pass the, the federal um, background check. So he doesn't have any felonies or sort of other things that would immediately make him ineligible for a sale. So with that as framing, I'm gonna turn it over to Jacqueline now. The rest of us will disappear for a bit, but then uh, we'll be back when she's done. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thanks, Emmy. I'm very excited to be here. Again, my name is Jacqueline Clark. I'm the co-owner of Bristlecone Shooting Training and Retail Center. So we're, like Emmy said, a, um, a retail spot. We've got about 6,000 6, square feet of retail. We focus on personal and home defense, competitive recreational shooting products. Um, and then we also have an indoor range and um, a wide variety of training classes. So kind of a one-stop shop. Um, my job today is to talk about the decision-making that happens at the point of sale. So what our staff uses and how we train them to identify um, a situation where we are going to no sale a customer versus going through with a firearm sale. Um, like Emmy said, we're focusing, um, our, our, our frame of reference is on the state of Colorado from a legal standpoint. So there's no waiting period in the state of Colorado. That means that a person could walk into our establishment, um, talk to our staff, decide which firearm they want to buy. Maybe they try it on the range and then they do the 4473. We run a background check and they're in and out of here in an hour or less, depending on um, how many people are actually purchasing a firearm at that moment in Colorado kind of dictates how long the background check check takes, but it is instant. So it's very important that our staff understands how to engage people in conversation and identify potential risk factors right there at that point of sale so, so we can avoid a bad situation um, immediately or down the road. Um, in the firearms industry, there's a number of reasons why we might no sale somebody. Um, one of them obviously is for mental health concerns, but there's, there's also something called a straw purchase that's against federal law. It's against federal law for somebody to come into a firearms retailer and buy a gun for someone else that they know could not pass a background check. Um, so a straw purchase, mental health concerns, um, you know, feeling like somebody has bad intentions after they leave with their firearm are some of the reasons why we might no sale someone. And the warning signs are things that we look for are similar across a number of those reasons. A another reason would be, um, you know, if somebody is on something, they're drunk or um, we suspect they've been using marijuana, something that would preclude them from firearms use or ownership, we no sale them for that, of course. Um, so, you know, in the example that Emmy gave, you're describing our average customer over the last couple of years. Somebody who has a family, um, is concerned about social unrest, things they're seeing on the news, first time firearms owner, maybe opens up a little bit about some stuff going on personally outside of home or as it relates to work, but no real red flags in those um, verbal cues that that person might be giving to a staff member. Um, we teach our staff to really focus on the nonverbal cues as well as the verbal cues that are being given um, during their conversations with the customers. The good news is the firearm sale is not you know, a, a quickie um, interaction, especially for a first time buyer like our example gentleman. 
It's very consultative. So our staff really has the opportunity to talk with that person, find out what they, um, what their experience, even if it's very brief with firearms has been in the past, um, what their goal is, whether they're going to keep it in their house or in their car, or they eventually want to get a permit and carry, there's a good opportunity for some conversation. And one of the biggest red flags for our staff is if that person doesn't want to engage in conversation. They're in a rush, they're not making eye contact, um, they seem nervous, they have a, a closed um, posture, not an open or confident posture. They're slouched. Um, our staff also looks at other things about their presence, you know, their clothes. I know in Emmy's example, um, this gentleman had inexpensive but casual clothes, but how do those clothes fit? Are they dirty? Are they not pressed? Um, are the pants too short? I mean, all kinds of things kind of glamorated together can give the staff a sense of whether or not this person may have um, may be in a state of mental crisis um, or have bad intentions. Um, we teach our staff to really trust their gut and we also have a um, kind of two-person authentication, authentication process or um, fact check if you will. You know if a staff member has been having a conversation with somebody who's trying to purchase a firearm and and they're just not getting a good feeling, either because of a combination of nonverbal cues or verbal cues. We always ask that they get somebody else involved, either a lead or a manager or one of the owners, to come talk to that person to see if, um, if they can ferret out the same concerns or, or maybe something else completely is going on. Um, I've got a good example of that. We had a woman come in here a couple of years ago who was exhibiting all the signs of somebody um, attempting a straw purchase. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's, it's a woman that, you know, these gang members or whoever send in and they instruct them uh, very loosely on what they need to buy. And this woman came in um, and she was rushed. She wasn't making eye contact. She seemed very nervous. And she walked over to one of the handgun cases and she said, um, I'll take two of those which is strange, you know, most people don't come into a gun store and want two of the exact same model um, right away in a rush. And she didn't wanna try them on the range. She wasn't interested in training class. She just wanted to get them and pay cash and leave as quickly as possible. So big red flags. Um, our staff member that was helping her came and got my husband actually, he ended up coming out and talking to her. And it turns out she was somebody we wanted to deny a sale to, but not for the reasons that we originally thought. She had filed a temporary restraining order against uh, an ex-boyfriend that she was afraid of. And she literally thought he was coming to get her that day. And she didn't know anything about firearms or how to protect herself. So she just decided to Google the closest gun store and thought she would come in there and get a gun and then she would be safe. So just to a lack of education um, combined with fear equals a situation where we denied the sale, but we gave her some other options. You know, we let her hang out in the members lounge for a little while and gave her some resources. And I think, you know, eventually she ended up buying a class and getting some training and, and becoming more savvy in general. But, you know, a, a, a no sale at the, at the point of sale decision can happen for a lot of reasons. And um, we involve two people because sometimes it takes two to, to decide whether or not we're actually gonna stop a sale and prevent somebody from um, purchasing that day. Um, you know, we, we had an example just yesterday that is, is in line with what we're talking about. A gentleman came in and um, he seemed seemed okay, talked with our staff for a while, but when he sat down to do the 4473, which is the federal questionnaire that, you know, asks you whether or not you have a felony, have you been adjudicated into a mental institution, a lot of different questions that you have to answer um, in your address and things like that. He, he really couldn't articulate his way through those questions. And that process brought out a couple of other red flags. Um, that made our staff uncomfortable with making a sale. Somebody who is not of the right mind enough to answer basic questions about where you live and, and your history also shouldn't be walking out of the store with a firearm um, that day. So, you know, the, the bottom line with the point of sale and, and kind of to, to back up 
to the example that Emmy gave, we look for both the conversation cues um, uh, as well as the nonverbal cues with our customers in order to make a decision about whether or not to move forward with the sale. Um, and we always involve more than one person if it gets to the point where um, the hair is standing up on the back of the associate's neck and, and they, they need to get a second opinion. Great, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, I already have lots of questions for you. <laughs> but um, So to the attendees, please, um, as you're thinking of questions, put them in the Q&A and then we'll circle back around. I think we're turning it over to you, Michael. So now uh, as an instructor, how you think about this and also please introduce yourself. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, I, I'm Michael Viktorov. I, I have worked uh, you know, many decades as a, a physician and um, in, in uh, family practice, primary care, general medicine, uh, and I, I teach a bit at the university. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, I uh, took up a much more active interest, uh, uh, you know, extending from a, a bit of childhood experience with firearms uh, to actually get myself uh, into the uh, sports of competitive shooting. And that led to uh, raising my training up to the instructor level in a number of firearms disciplines, uh, including pistol, rifle, shotgun, personal protection, home defense, um, close quarters combat, uh, and concealed carry. Uh, those kinds of things have uh, given me exposure to a number of students over the years uh, in uh, who have come for classes. And, and Jacqueline's experience uh, uh, overlaps this considerably because she runs classes in her store as well. Uh, but, but just focusing on the uh, instructor's experience, uh, it, it give you a, kind of a, a, an overview, a, a context. Uh, I am certified by the National Rifle Association, which is the largest uh, firearms um, training organization probably in the world. Uh, you know, I don't know about the Chinese army, but the, the NRA certainly trains more people uh, than the US uh, military. Um, uh, there are 125,000 instructors uh, who are certified by the NRA and uh, roughly a million students per year in the United States uh, take one or more NRA classes. Uh, there are dozens of uh, uh, classes in the course syllabus uh, for the NRA. Uh, as as well as probably a score, you know, at least a, a large handful of other uh, training organizations that uh, do specific firearms training. Uh, I'm also certified by an organization uh, known as the United States Concealed Carry As Association. This is much smaller than the NRA, but it's an organization uh, dedicated specifically to defensive uh, firearms use. Um, the, these are not the only training uh, resources in the United States. Uh, 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 shooting sports um, are uh, participated in by more people than uh, sports like uh, soccer and volleyball and uh, tennis and swimming. Uh, lots of people. It's not a hunting thing. It's, it's a, a shooting sports thing. And so we have the Olympic Training Center down uh, in Colorado Springs that has a very extensive uh, uh, shooting and coaching um, program, as well as 4-H uh, club, uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, uh, other, uh, you know, some colleges have uh, shooting programs. The, you know, there's a lot of shooting around the United States and many, many instructors. I'm going to ignore the fact that there are 150,000 uh, recruits every year to the U.S. military uh, who also uh, almost all go through some uh, form of firearms instruction. So there's, there's a lot of firearms training. Uh, what would be the, the potential for using that exposure in training classes uh, to help in, uh, intercept uh, a troubled student or, or flag someone who is going through a crisis? Uh, and, you know, and what are the uh, capabilities of a, a, a firearms instructor uh, for intervening? Well, um, you know, good news, bad news. Uh, I will say that the, uh, the organizations that I have been certified by uh, begin by uh, actually making it 
a, a little bit hard and troublesome to become certified. Uh, not everyone can just uh, stand up and say, I'm a, I'm a trainer. And uh, not everyone can say, I uh, have taken a class and I, I believe I'm safe enough to apply to my local sheriff for a concealed carry uh, permit. Um, many students, in fact, uh, I would say the majority of uh, students who come to me uh, for pistol training, which is by far the most popular firearm th that people are interested in the United States, um, most of them have in the back of their mind the thought that I might want to consider using this for defensive purposes, no matter what their uh, uh, they, they say their, their principal uh, desire is in, in attending a class. Many people attend a class not really even sure what they wanted to do with their gun. And that's great because that gives us a, a chance to expose them a little bit to firearms safety culture. Um, but the, the instructor uh, process is fairly rigorous and uh, there is an ethics component. Uh, the NRA trainers uh, guide uh, to ethical behavior uh, is really quite extensive and it covers uh, primarily ways to avoid harm, but also respect uh, dignity, act professionally and avoid an anything that even looks like uh, discrimination. There's also some very specific material about consent uh, for things like, you know, touching on the range and, and uh, it's really fairly uh, detailed in, in terms of the deportment um, uh, and conduct of instructors. Um, the, the general culture of the firearms community uh, reflected largely by the people who take classes and teach them um, is almost fanatically dedicated to safety. But the, 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 the main principles for teaching uh, safety and uh, the skills of uh, marksmanship and, and uh, firearms handling are kind of summed up in the motto uh, at the NRA, which is uh, explained before every single class, uh, we are here to study uh, knowledge, skills, and attitude. Um, and there are uh, written tests that conclude almost every one of the classes that I'm a part of. So this gives the instructor a larger window uh, than the you know, one or two hours that uh, the retail salesperson gets to sort of examine the behavior and uh, um, uh, the, the kind of look and feel of the students in class. However, um, you know, it's eight hours or 12 hours divided sometimes up over a few days. Um, that's, that's not like a semester um, you know, in school. Um, one thing about the values that uh, we need to uh, accommodate as firearms instructors is uh, it directly uh, pertinent to what we're talking about now, which is risk assessment. There is a sort of a skepticism in the uh, shooting community about the idea of psychological uh, health. Uh, it, it's not that um, uh, people who are shooters don't understand that they're crazy people. That, that, you know, that's vernacular, that's common. But there is, uh, and to some extent it's justified, a bit of skepticism about whether another person can look at me and decide how I'm going to behave over not only the next weeks and months or years, uh, but over a lifetime uh, by assessing my character in, in some fashion. And uh, that uh, does weigh on the mind of an instructor who's looking at a, a student who might be problematic in some ways uh, and asking the question, do I refuse a certificate to this person um, oh, and, and uh, force them to go next door to the next instructor who's gonna see them in a different um, uh, uh, set of circumstances and probably will give them the same certificate that I'm withholding. So the, the power, the overall power that uh, instructors have uh, pretty much is limited to, uh, if you don't satisfy me about knowledge, skills, and attitude, uh, I may withhold your certificate. Um, and the certificate has one very important capability in Colorado, let's forget the 50 other you know, possible jurisdictions, but in Colorado, 
you have to show a certificate from a certified instructor in, in a, a recognized organization. You have to bring that along with your application and fingerprints to your local sheriff if you're going to be uh, considered for a concealed carry permit in Colorado. So you got to get that certificate for concealed carry. Um, just a side comment, uh, many of the instructors I work with uh, believe that concealed carry is much less socially problematic than open carry, uh, which you don't need a certificate for at all, and which is legal also in Colorado with you know a number of stipulations. Uh, we consider concealed carry to be much more socially acceptable and the level of training that we aim for, just, I'm just talking about uh, defensive pistol and concealed carry, carry classes. We're looking for a level of competence at, in all respects that is typically much higher than the average patrol officer or sheriff's deputy uh, uh, you know, who works for uh, law enforcement. That's not saying that SWAT teams uh, aren't trained to a very high level. That's true, but that's a specialty. Talking about the average patrol officer, to get out of my class in concealed carry, you probably have to demonstrate a lot more skills and knowledge than uh, uh, at least a beginning patrol officer out on the street. But magical thinking, though, uh, uh, Jacqueline also mentioned this, the notion that the simple presence of the gun, uh, carrying it around or having it in, in under my pillow, that itself makes me safe is one of the first uh, misimpressions that we try to remove uh, from the class. And uh, also when, when we do presentations for people who are not shooters or interested in shooting, we try to um, counteract the opposite magical thinking that there is no way to safely own and handle and manage um, a firearm. But both of those are extremes uh, that we try to disabuse people of. Which uh, brings me to, you, you know, sort of the ultimate dilemma. Um, journalism, uh, public education, uh, health care, uh, and public policy uh, people in the United States are, are catastrophically uh, misinformed uh, in general about uh, firearms, knowledge, skills, and attitude. Th this is something that the instructor community tries to address. Um, but of course, th there are a thousand barriers. Um, I, I will just give one anecdote from a, a recent case I, I dealt with, uh, uh, not as an instructor, but, but as, uh, uh, as a physician. Um, I came across a colleague uh, who was a, a, metal, a behavior health professional who actually um, got into a situation where they uh, joined into a firearms class with one of their patients who uh, was diagnosed with a dissociative identity disorder. Uh, this is the uh, multiple personality disorder that people are familiar with, which is uh, at times extremely disabling and presents, uh, you know, the, the potential for a person who goes into a state of mind where they really don't know what they're doing and can uh, shift to another state of mind where they have no knowledge of what uh, they were doing in their other state of mind. You know, this is this split personality person. It's really a very serious, fairly rare, but quite disabling disorder. And uh, this colleague uh, actually approved this person uh, to go through a firearms class. Now, I don't know if I would have recognized uh, the the signs of such a person in a class, I have to say, even with eight hours to watch someone, that's a very narrow slice of an observation window. And most people, e even people who are fairly disturbed, are able to function socially uh, uh, well enough, you know, to go in and out of a grocery store and probably sit for a few hours in a in a in a firearms class and not display signs of overt dysfunction. So I, I have to uh, raise the question about if we did a survey, hey, how many of you really are mentally disabled or disordered or, or dangerous? You know, who would raise their hand and what would I do? Well, the legal issue, uh, the legal power I have is pretty much the mercantile power of the freedom to serve whom I choose 
as a, um, a private entity uh, conducting commerce in, in the United States. I'm not authorized uh, to make a diagnosis or, you know, I, I, I can call the police like any citizen can, but uh, in my class, the only thing that I can legally do, and I am protected from liability, is to say, uh, I'm afraid you haven't satisfied my criteria, you know, for successful completion, and I'm not going to give you this certificate, no matter how much you plead or whine or cry, you know, I'm sorry, and I'm allowed to do that. Uh, talking both to the USCCA and the NRA, talk, I talked to their trainer um, uh, organization leaders, and what they've said is that's pretty much it, that it, we reserve the right to, to deny ser service to anyone, and as long as uh, it can't be shown that we were discriminating according to, you know, some legal criteria, uh, we, um, we're covered legally and ethically. So, uh, that's kind of where I'm going to stop. I just don't want to let anyone get uh, an illusion. I, I hold out the hope that trainers can can play a role in making the world safer, but I don't want to give anyone a misimpression about how much power we really have. Great, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, I've got lots of questions for you also, and thanks for the to the folks who put a few questions in the Q and A already. And I promise we will get to them. Um, as I turn over now to my portion and, and thinking about what happens in the ER, I want to continue our case. And I think one of the themes here is that there's time. And also in the ER, we often have additional information that uh, Michael or Jacqueline wouldn't have had. Um, so our, our, our case study man purchases his gun. He takes a course. There are no red flags. He finishes the course. But a few weeks later, his wife brings him into the ER um, because she's worried. She found him crying, uh, intoxicated with alcohol and holding his handgun. Uh, he's never done anything like this before, but it turns out he's had a worsening problem with alcohol, daily drinking that's been escalating. He works the night shift and um, unfortunately was just fired today because he showed up for work drunk. Uh, she said they've been fighting about finances too, very common. And, you know, especially during the pandemic, money's been tight um, and her hours were cut, making it even more stressful. He did slap her once uh, last week during a fight, which is the first time that that's happened. And to add on, he's a veteran um, and is particularly sad around Veterans Day because one of his um, best friends from the army died by suicide on Veterans Day in a prior year. So she's worried about him. She also tried to make him give her the firearm, but he won't. So she's called 911. Um, the ambulance brings, her to, brings him to the ER um, and that's where we pick up. I'm a very visual learner, so I do have a couple of slides. I promise it's not too many. Um, so what do we do in the ER? And I think sometimes there's also this um, impression that we know everything. <laughs> and risk assessment is also an inexact science for us and uh, could be a whole lecture in and of itself. I will say, whenever we're doing a risk assessment on someone, we are thinking both about patient rights and patient safety, as well as the safety of those around them. Um, I, I once had a lawyer say to me, um, you know, who is, who is uh, concerned about somebody who'd been discharged with potential suicide risk. And he said, well, why don't, can't you just lock them all up? And of course we can't just lock everyone up because that's a violation of their rights to be held against their will. Um, at the same time, if someone is deemed an imminent threat to themselves or other people, then we do have the authority uh, for an involuntary uh, psychiatric hospitalization, we always hope that uh, those hospitalizations instead can be voluntary, and many individuals do agree uh, to inpatient treatment when it's appropriate. So when I talk about rights and safety here, I'm not actually even talking specifically about firearm rights and safety, but just generally that we need to remember that individuals uh, going through any kind of mental health crisis still have rights and still um, uh, we need to be aware of those at the same time that we are trying to ensure their safety. We're in the ER, we're really focused on an imminent threat. So is someone, do we have evidence to suggest that someone is imminently going to harm themselves or someone else, um, particularly if it's a named specific person, in which case we have reporting requirements with the police. Um, you know, unfortunately, we often see people who have, say, chronic substance abuse problems or chronic depression and or other risk factors for potential harm to themselves or others 
at some point in the future. Um, but if there's not an imminent threat, then most often those individuals um, are discharged from the ER with some kind of outpatient treatment plan. And perhaps one of the most important things we do, which is not always available in other settings, is that we gather so-called collateral information. We talk to the wife, we get the report from EMS, we can ask questions like, what did the house look like? Um, if police are already involved, we may get a little information from them. I do wanna point out, we don't have access to any police records or court records. So we won't know somebody's legal history um, other than what they might tell us. Um, you know, we might talk to best friends and so forth. And we usually do this with patient permission when we can, um, but it's critically important. And this is, I think the piece where, um, as Michael was saying, someone who even has profound, um, some kind of profound uh, mental health crisis might be able to hide some of it, um, but their family and friends might tell a very different story about what's been going on at home. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about all the ins and outs of suicide risk assessment. For those who are interested, this is a great guide uh, that was a consensus process a few years ago, but I want to use it just to highlight a couple of things about how we think about this. And I think the same goes really for someone at risk of homicide. You know, in my case, the fact that he'd slapped his wife and has a firearm certainly raises the risk um, for violence towards her or even her death. So the first thing is we have to decide if someone has capacity um, to make healthcare decisions, particularly if someone is intoxicated, we can't do this process until they've sobered um, or if they have some other medical emergency um, that is impairing their capacity to participate in a discussion and counseling um, and assessment, then uh, basically we have to wait until um, it, it is appropriate. So when someone has some kind of acute risk, these are the kinds of things we think about. Um, you know, that do they have a specific suicide plan? Are they intending to act on it? Have they had a, are they here for an attempt or a past attempt? Do they have past attempts? Um, do they have a diagnosed significant mental health condition? Um, substance use disorder is a huge one. Um, and then kind of getting back to what Jacqueline and Michael were looking at, we do look at things like, you know, are they acting particularly irritable or agitated or aggressive in the ER or from what family are reporting? And then there are these very complicated lists of things we look at either as a, an ER physician using something like the safety, which is a tool that you can find online. Or if you're very lucky, like in my case, you have 24 seven trained behavioral health evaluators um, who can spend a lot of time with patients going through this, really looking at the risk factors, protective factors, what's actually going on in terms of the specific circumstance today. And then they try to formulate it into a plan for, um, for what makes the most sense. And what I will just say is that it's complicated. <laughs> it's really unique to an individual situation. There's no sort of easy computer algorithm that we can plug people into, no easy answers. Um, and uh, so this is where it really takes gathering all that information and then having someone who is trained in putting all the pieces together to decide what someone's imminent risk is. And then deciding basically if, if, a, there, if a psychiatric inpatient hospitalization is warranted or if they are able to go home, then that's where we really talk about reducing firearm access when they're at home to make sure the home is safe. So we always, if someone is being discharged home, whether it's for suicide risk or there's domestic violence involved um, or other risk of violence, we always first wanna think about voluntary and temporary changes, um, particularly because we want the person with suicide risk to be engaged in their own care. And so hopefully they'll be willing to do something like give the gun to uh, someone else, depending on what state laws allow or storing it out of the home uh, and so forth. In a case like the one we talked about, if, if, the, if he was actually deemed able to go home, um, but wouldn't give up his gun, uh, the wife would have an option to file for an extreme risk protection order. Um, in Colorado, only family and police can request those. So I just wanna point out in our state, healthcare providers cannot um, actually place a, an ERPO, which, which temporarily removes firearms from someone's possession. Um, in some states, healthcare providers can do that. Um, we generally don't report back to the police to say, hey, we're sending this guy home, we're, but we're worried about him and he has guns at home. We don't really have a mechanism to be able to do that. And it, it would be probably an inappropriate sharing of medical information um, unless there were some other kind of unique circumstances. Uh, so generally what happens in the ER sort of stays in the ER, I guess. It's certainly medical records, but there's not necessarily cross-linking between medical records and police, for example. 
Um, so I'm going to stop there now and um, turn it over to Rick and then um, um, please introduce yourself and then we'll have um, some Q&A. Okay, Hi, everyone. Uh, Emmy, thank you. Um, and it's really fun to do this with Michael and Jacqueline and Emmy. Um, I'm Rick Martinez. I'm the Director of Forensic Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Colorado. I also run a, a fellowship program. And like Emmy, I'm, I'm visual and some of these concepts, I just think will be easier to show you some slides. So I'm gonna go through a series of slides. I was asked to sort of pick up, as we looked at uh, the roles that each of us play, sort of a check and balance on the issue of the relationship between guns and potential dangerousness, either suicide or, or uh, homicide. I was asked to talk a little bit about the ERPOs and risk assessment in general. So first, for those of you who might not know, forensic psychiatry is a subspecialty in psychiatry. We work uh, in the, uh, if you will, in the criminal, correctional, civil, regulatory, legislative matters. And one of the areas that uh, we do uh, get special training in is doing risk assessments in general. And it's really broad, the kinds of risk assessments that forensic psychiatry and my colleagues in forensic psychology actually do. Uh, it can be anything from uh, civil commitment, involuntary medication, issues of criminal sentencing and mitigation, uh, pain, uh, patient dangerousness assessments in civil settings uh, at the time of discharge from hospitals or tran transitions of care. We sometimes get asked to do second opinions, uh, sex offender assessments, uh, juvenile transfer and reverse transfer assessments, fitness for duty, university disciplinary uh, proceedings, pre-employment screening. And even uh, in other areas of the, of the criminal justice system, competency assessments now in the state of Colorado require for us to make some assessment about whether restoration would be better handled in a hospital or on an outpatient basis. And then lastly, uh, NGRI equities, there's assessments, uh, risk assessments that start at the time of entry into that system. And then of course, as NGRI equities begin to progress into the community, there's a need for doing risk assessments. So the ERPOs is, a, is, a, is kind of another area that's developing, certainly in the jurisdictions where ERPOs have been uh, adopted. So just real quick, gun deaths in US as a reminder, 2018, over 39,000 gun deaths, 24,000 of those by su or were suicides, uh, almost 14,000 homicides. And um, looking at five-year averages, 103 gun deaths per day, 67 were suicides, 37 homicides, uh, and then of course the involvement of children and issues of, of race as well on that slide. ERPOs now, there's 19 states and DC have these extreme risk laws. Uh, Connecticut was the first in 1999, Indiana followed. Uh, and then after Sandy Hook, there was a consortium for risk-based firearm policy that came together and you can go to uh, the website and learn a great deal. Uh, they act as educators and consultants in helping states draft these laws. A um, couple of uh, notable points I wanna make. They steered away from uh, specifically firearm prohibitions on mental illness alone, as this was not supported obviously by research and there was concern about uh, further stigmatization and clearly, uh, those with firearms who may qualify under ERPO do not necessarily have a formalized mental illness per se. More likely for those with at suicide risk than with homicide risk, but we'll talk a little bit about that. So the emphasis is really on behaviors rather than on diagnosis. Think of this as a new type of civil order based on the legal framework developed in domestic violence protection orders uh, with a focus on risk factors. And California uh, came along most recently after the University of California Santa Barbara shooting. So these red, also called red flag laws, uh, it's a civil process. It pays attention to due process and provides due process protections. And as Emmy just said, usually the petitioners are either law enforcement or some family member or household member, but there are some jurisdictions that include health professionals, school administrators, and others. And I've listed three down there. For example, mental health professionals can be petitioners in DC, Hawaii, and Maryland. Uh, teachers and school administrators 
uh, are permitted to petition in California, Hawaii, and New York. And lastly, in California, I think the only state of the 19, uh, co-workers and employers can actually act as petitioners. Here's some information about the Colorado statute. Um, petitioner, as I said, can be the family uh, household member or law enforcement. And this is to obtain what we call the temporary ERPO. Uh, it has to be demonstrated that the individual poses a significant risk to self or others by having a firearm, acquiring a firearm, or purchasing a firearm. There has to be an affidavit. Uh, and the, they use the preponderance of evidence standard in this first uh, temporary ERPO. There has to be a hearing in person or telephone on the day or day of the petition. Now, after 14 days, there's a second hearing. And at that hearing, more formalized, there is a standard of clear and convincing evidence standard that has to uh, be obtained in order for the ERPO to be a, quote, continued ERPO up to one year. Uh, the petitioner can request an extension at some point, again, by clear and convincing evidence. Uh, and lastly, the respondent can motion the court at any point within a year, at least on one occasion, to essentially demonstrate to the court that they no longer are at risk and ha should have their firearms returned. What are some of the risk factors we should consider when we're thinking about ERPOs? Obviously, I think uh, Emmy and Michael and other and Jacqueline have mentioned the, the issue of recent acts or threats of violence a history of threatening or dangerous behavior, history of current risky alcohol or other drug use, and I'll talk about that in a moment, alcohol use both in suicide as well as in uh, violence risk assessment is a very, very important risk factor. Recent violation of a domestic violence protective order, unlawful rec or reckless use, display, or brandishing a, a firearm, recent acquisition of a firearm, cruelty to animals, and note again, the emphasis on behaviors, not necessarily diagnosis. And to follow up some of the research in California, uh, uh, out of 159 orders between uh, over a two year period, 21 orders involved individuals who intended to commit a mass shooting. So there's anecdotal information now as these laws take effect to uh, lead us to believe that we these laws may be effective in preventing mass shootings. Uh, Connecticut, who's been around the longest with one of these laws, 762 orders involving an average of seven guns over a 14-year period. Uh, suicidality or self-injury listed in greater than 61% of the cases. And it was estimated, it's been estimated that uh, for every 10 to 20 removals, perhaps one life is saved. And this is duplicated in an Indiana study. Uh, Emmy asked me to comment a little bit about returning weapons. So some of the questions you want to ask yourself if you're evaluating someone, uh, and I've consulted in a couple of cases uh, about having weapons returned after an, a successful ERPO. So first you got to ask yourself, uh, was this initiated because of a concern about self-harm, harm to others or both? That's obviously an important question in terms of assessing whether uh, if you will, the, uh, the risk has been reduced and therefore maybe there is uh, justification for returning the weapons. You wanna review what we call base risk status for this individual. Um, and the issue of uh, evaluating presence or absence of static factors, including a history of violence. So those things aren't gonna change. I mean, if this is an individual who has a previous history of domestic violence, or a previous history of violence. That is what we call a static factor. That's part of their history. Um, I, I'm not gonna be able to have time to get into this in depth, but the issue of psychopathy, of course, uh, is something that as a forensic evaluator, I'm gonna be looking at. Um, and we don't have time to go in how one might assess this, but the, the triad of psychopathy, substance abuse, and a past history of violence are probably the most telling risk factors uh, uh, in terms of um, the possibility of recidivism to violence. So what we're looking at is how has the risk stated, state changed since the initiation of the ERPO? We're looking at dynamic factors. So for example, if substance abuse was a key ingredient, I wanna know and we wanna know, has this person taken steps to address that substance issue in some way? In the suicidal individual, if the person was profoundly depressed at the time, that the ERPO uh, was initiated? 
has that depression been treated and some of the symptoms of the depression resolved in some way. I will close real quick with uh, a little bit about for violence risk assessment. Um, historically, we have uh, moved uh, dramatically from 35 years ago when there was this uh, mythology that we somehow could predict dangerousness. And clearly um, the uh, science and the art of risk assessment has moved to recognize that no one can predict dangerousness. No one can predict whether someone will or will not commit suicide or will or will not uh, engage in a violent act, but we can do we can standardize risk assessments themselves, and I think Emmy already covered a little bit about uh, the suicide risk assessment and the standardization in that area. We talked already a little bit about static versus dynamic factors, and one of the most important areas of research has been to determine what we call base rates and population rates. So it's very very important that if we're looking at a particular individual. Uh, how do they, their violence risk or suicide risk compares to uh, a similar group of individuals within, with, with, that share those characteristics. Uh, a little bit about static and dynamic uh, factors. I mentioned the issue of past violence, psychopathy and substance use. Um, we don't have time to go into the discussion about psychosis itself. You've often heard that uh, the mentally ill are more likely to be victims to violence than to perpetuate, uh, perpetrate, excuse me, uh, violence, and that is true. However, there are some subsets within the mentally ill where paying attention to the nature of the psychosis, the nature of delusions, is a very, very important part of assessment uh, in terms of uh, relationship to violence. Well, I'm looking at the time. I want to just move. I think what I'm going to do is just go because we've covered a lot of this. Uh, Emmy talked a little bit about the suicide uh, risk assessment pieces. Um, protective factors, um, just to emphasize that, especially in the suicidal individual, obviously family and supports, social supports, treatment engagement, family a sense of family responsibility, pregnancy itself, child-related concerns, religious and cultural beliefs, and uh, speaking of the ER, actually having a scheduled follow-up appointment is actually uh, considered a protective factor. So thank you, and we can uh, then have enough time for questions. Great, thank you so much. Uh, as we expected, uh, more probably more questions than we'll have time to answer, but um, I find it really interesting and uh, to sort of think about the similar challenges we face, um, as well as some of the differences in how we how we do things. Um, so to jump into questions um, to the audience, please feel free to keep putting them in. Um, so first one, maybe kind of maybe simple to get us off, Jacqueline, some questions about sort of the process of a no sale and how you tell people. Um, but also do the what are the legal rights of people attempting to purchase a firearm? in terms of non-discrimination or do they have a sort of a right to purchase or do you have a right to refuse sale to anyone? Very good combination of questions. Okay, so there's two types of no sales. Technically there's a dealer denial and then there's a background check denial, a NICS denial or a CBI background check that comes back um, as an automatic no sale. So what we've been talking about today is the dealer denial. So where the dealer makes a discretionary decision not to move forward with the sale, usually before they even input the customer into the background check system. Um, and again, we, we would do that for um, discretionary concerns, verbal and nonverbal cues, things that, that are making us, uh, the things that are throwing up those red flags and, and we're not gonna to continue with the sale. Um, the process for that is, you know, we get our internal process is we get a couple people involved in making that decision. But once the decision is made, the dealer is actually required to have the customer sign the 4473, um, even if we are denying the sale. So we deliver that message after they've completed the 4473 and signed it, because if you don't, a lot of times the customer will get angry and leave the store. Um, and then we don't have that signature and we're not in compliance with the ATF regulations. Um, so depending on how the conversation has gone down dictates how we deliver the message. Our associates are uh, trained on how to deliver the message, but sometimes they do get a manager or an owner involved if, if they're concerned that the individual is gonna be really upset or cause a scene um, and be difficult 
to, to handle on the way out the door. Um, you know, we, we teach our staff to deliver it in a very matter, matter of fact way. Um, sometimes we choose to give the reason. Other times we're a little bit more general and let them know that this is not a day that we're going to proceed with the sale on. Um, we are a privately held business. It's completely our discretion whether or not we serve a customer or not. Um, but it does bring up concerns about discrimination. We have to be very careful. Um, you know, we never make the decision to no sale somebody because only one of the factors is there. So we never make the decision solely based on appearance or any sort of demographic information or solely on um, what they're wearing. It's a combination of uh, factors and we do involve multiple people in that decision. And that's how we you know, protect ourselves against somebody crying discrimination. Um, you know, the Second Amendment is what people have when they come into my facility. So I have to be careful that I'm choosing to deny that right for good reason. And we have to be able to defend that if it ever, ever came, came, came down to it. Thanks, Jacqueline. And do you, I, I, I thought, I think I remember you saying once that sometimes retailers, if there's somebody who's really suspicious or concerning, that you might then call other retailers yes. in the area to give them a, can you comment on that? Yep, so we're required by the ATF to keep a list of all of the dealer denied folks. And we keep that in a shared access point for our staff in case somebody tries to come back on a different day and take advantage of you know our, our shift work and shift changes um, in staff. But absolutely, so we, we are collaborative with a number of other retailers and ranges in our vicinity. And if somebody comes into our facility and we feel like they're an immediate threat, um, we deal or deny them and we think they may go somewhere else. Um, we, we have a protocol on the list and phone numbers and contact information. We let those establishments know immediately. And we had a recent example where um, that exact thing happened. Somebody came in, they clearly had bad intentions, very concerning behavior. We denied the sale, um, but we we're always careful to get enough contact information in a situation like that, as well as the description that we can call um, those places. And this person went down to a, a, a place in um, kind of in the southeast part of town and tried to purchase there. I'm curious, Michael, do you, is there any kind of um, similar action, like for, for someone who's maybe passed a, a class, but, or, or not passed the class or been denied the sort of proof that they need to go get a concealed carry license? Is there any information shared like that among instructors or is it always a fresh start? Like, do you know someone's training history, I guess? Uh, no, uh, but that, that's kind of a weakness in the in instructor uh, network. Um, I do, I, I'm, absolutely sure that uh, the, the certifying organizations have records of people who signed up for a class and then for some reason or other didn't complete. And I bet there are statistics at the NRA with a million a year. I bet they have statistics about uh, the, the people who did not complete or, or who were failed. Um, uh, there are many reasons, th though, to not complete. And so they're, they're not necessarily prejudicial. And uh, I have never seen the NRA publish any of that information. So th there are, you know, loose networks, uh, uh, social networks of instructors, but no, there is no reporting requirement. BATF uh, pretty much doesn't govern uh, in, uh, firearms instruction, you know, except that you're not allowed to uh, have a person in class who's a prohibited person, you know, 4473 prohibited. The, the one thing I'll, I'll add is that the window we have um, th that the, the retail person may not always get is we watch them handle the gun. We watch them interact with other people. We watch them at lunch. You know, we, we do get to see, you know, behavior. We do have behavioral profiling that gives us a lot more of a database. Uh, but uh, again, um, it, it's nothing like uh, what parents, neighbors, school teachers, you know, and even occasionally doctors have. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. And I, I think to close it out, I'll just say, you know, I think one theme here was, uh, as you mentioned, database issues and that this is hard and there's not a lot of publicly available data. There's certainly a need to balance privacy, but also uh, as we move forward, think about how can we be tracking these things and understand are there patterns of what's going on? Certainly on the ERPOs, what's happening afterwards? Are they being abused? Are firearms being returned? Deaths being prevented and so forth. So lots of good stuff 
for us to keep working on. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for uh, everyone who attended. We will be sending out a link to the webinar as well. Um, and please feel free to contact us with any questions. Thank you and be safe. <laughs>